Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I am Bob, a drug addict and an alcoholic. <laughs> Newcomers, you gotta wonder what they did, right? <laughs> Fuck up consistently for years and you get a big ovation in a meeting. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> they're here because their whole life is absolute shambles and we're clapping. I feel a little strange speaking at the 13th annual Young People. <laughs> Unfortunately, I passed that 40 a few years back down the line. But uh, I can remember when uh, we didn't want anybody over 40 at the podium for any reason. We felt they had nothing to offer but money. <clears throat> and there were a couple of groups in Southern California where we charged them a buck a minute if they wanted to participate. <laughs> And they paid those who were really good-hearted and didn't have an ego. They could get up and do it, you know, help us out because we didn't know that we needed help. Now here I am, one of those over 40. Oh, God. You know, I always get blown away when a lot of people show up because I, I live with me 24 hours a day, see. And I know what a joke it is that you're all here listening to me. <laughs> That's why I don't get nervous anymore. I haven't for years. I can't take any of this serious. <laughs> you just kind of learn that, you know, nobody must be taking it too serious. <clears throat> it's like, um, because about the only thing I can share with anybody is the fact that based on my experience and the experience of the people who are close to me, who I really have grown to love and know over the years in AA, is that A, sobriety is painful. B, it's long if you don't drink. <clears throat> C, you may find that you are slightly mentally unbalanced after you've been sober a while. The longer you are sober, you may get more in touch with how mentally unbalanced you are. <clears throat> and then when you finally reach this point in sobriety where... <clears throat> Unequivocally, you are less afraid of what you think God has in store for you than you are of the pain, than the pain you're in today you'll let go. And I'm convinced that seems to be about the only time most people let go. And isn't it interesting that we are involved in a program which says that it is spiritual by all definitions? The book of Alcoholics Anonymous says the main object of this book is to help you find the power greater than yourself. Doesn't say the main object is to get you sober, to get you your old lady back, to get you job, to get you a new automobile, to get you nothing. It says the main object of this book is to help you find power greater than yourself. Which means they're great they're, which means therefore that we're going to talk a great deal about God. <clears throat> now you would think a logical person would think that people who have been through what we have been through to get here if we came in the doors and we sat down in a chair and somebody said, look, i got this solution for you. I'm going to lay on you a book, man, and if you read this book and do what it says in this book, it will turn your life around. You can have all the things you ever hoped for, dreamed of, anything in the world is possible. It is here for you. One would think <laughs> that filled with that information, and based on the flamethrower we got in our ass coming through the door, <laughs> that we would embrace this <laughs> and say, yeah, lay it on me, because we did that with everything else anybody gave us, you know, <laughs> and the stuff wasn't promoted near as good as AA, see? <laughs> Here they tell us we're going to make new friends, we're going to find a new way of life, we're going to find a spiritual way to live, we're going to be happy, we're going to be joyous, we're going to be prosperous. And we get this horrified look on our face like that. 
Well. And yet, when we were out there drinking and using, somebody come up and say, hey, take this, okay? This is going to turn your stomach over, flatten your fucking head, knock you down on the ground. <laughs> You're going to throw up for a week, man, but let me tell you, it's perfect. We go for it. <laughs> Where's mine? <laughs> Which might lead somebody to believe that we are conditioned to pain. See? Because there's no logical reason in the world why we, coming from where the hell we come from, come in Alcoholics Anonymous, drop our ass in the chair, and then do everything in our power to avoid working this program. <laughs> and that's the truth. You may not even want to look at it, but it's the truth. Then why the hell do we do that? I don't know why you do it, but I know why I did it. I did it because my friendly mind, this thing that has been lurking on my shoulders forever, <clears throat> Unfortunately, it came with me to AA. <laughs> now, I was a burned out, nine tenths dead, dope fiend alcoholic at about 135 pounds, sleeping on rooftops when I got here, okay? I had no money, no car, no girlfriend, no job, nothing. Just sick and dying, all right? Came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, sat down, looked around the room, was in, our, in uh, Altadena, California. Had no place to live, nothing. Skinny, almost dead. And this mind of mine, this wonderful mind, looked at this AA meeting and said, Oh, Jesus, we sunk to the bottom this time. <laughs> Into the goddamn road, man. No more fun. Fun, right? I mean, I love what we call fun. Okay? I mean, fun is years in and out of institutions being studied under glass by criminal psychologists, gunned down in the streets by the police department, just generally having a good time. You know what I mean? <laughs> Summer vacation, you sort of send a postcard. <laughs> having great fun, wish you were here. As soon as I get the bullet out of my neck, <clears throat> I'll call you. <laughs> It seems that for me, I put a lot of resistance up to working this program because if this is the end of the road, if there's no more fun, if there's no more good times, if there ain't nothing worthwhile, then why the hell put any effort into it? I mean, if all this is is a holding action here, if all I'm doing is staving off the use of narcotics and alcohol, as long as I do that, I'm okay, right? As long as I don't drink any use today, I'm okay. Hey, there are days that's really true. There are days that the best thing you're going to do that day is you will not get loaded. And some of you may not want to hear that yet. You may not have achieved that point in your sobriety yet. <laughs> some of you may never. You know, but I have found that there are a large number of us that are a little shaky here. And it's wonderful that <clears throat> I and the people who are close to me in, in my early sobriety missed the significance of the fact that the second step was second. Why do you suppose these hundred old timers, man, who struggled to get a hundred of them who could stay sober a year, and finally they did, and finally they wrote a book, and the very step they put second said, we're nuts came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, which means immediately that obviously we are not there. Okay? I think one of the things that can set you freer than anything else in the world in sobriety is the acceptance of the fact that you're not all there. Now you've got a place from where to work. As long as I'm running around trying to pretend I'm sane, oh, God, in those bad days, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's much the days that you're driving in your car and you're breaking the steering wheel in little pieces and chewing on edges of it and screaming at people in traffic, but you're okay, you know, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. My program's all right, don't fuck with me, you know what I mean? <clears throat> Nobody's talking to me about my goddamn ego. If you had what I had, you'd feel like I feel too, you know what I mean? <clears throat> Now, 
I have found out for me as a boy, it seemed to go in, it seemed to go in steps. <clears throat> and in the beginning, I think those of us who arrive here are totally devastated by the chemicals. I mean, there's just nothing left. No brain power, no body power, nothing. You just kind of sit and drool <clears throat> at your early meetings. I think you're really fortunate, and I think we are fortunate, because we, we know that the one thing we don't want to do is use chemicals again. We don't know that we want sobriety. I don't know that I want a spiritual way of life. I don't know that I want to attend any meetings forever, for Christ's sake. I don't know any of these things. All I know is I can't get loaded one more time because I'm going to die. That I do know. That's like ingrained or be incarcerated forever. So we've got that one simplified, okay? So you get in the program, and if you get good sponsorship, they get you busy. All right? They keep you going. They tell you you've got to have activity in order to not drink and use today. You've got to work at it. You've got to haul newcomers, go to meetings, make coffee, move chairs, mop floors. Just generally pitch in, right? So they, if they're physically, physically bigger than you are and you're petrified of them because you know your sponsors are totally insane, <clears throat> and they, they threaten you with physical harm in order to get you to do these things, you do these things, you know what I mean? You move the goddamn chairs, you mop the floor, you make the lousy coffee, you contemplate putting raid in it for those at the meeting that you don't like. <clears throat> but you make the coffee, right? My sponsors told me the right action is always important. Motives will come later. <laughs> If I sit around waiting for good motives, I'll die before I ever make one move in behalf of another human being. <laughs> so just make the coffee. Don't worry about making it with a good attitude. Mop the floor. It doesn't matter if you hate it. Hate everybody in the room. Fold the chairs and put them away. Even if you're so hostile, you slam them shut and crash your fingers in them. <clears throat> doesn't matter. Do these things. You get busy with this kind of stuff, and you get going along, and next thing you know, you got a year, man. You blow out your year candle, and now your sponsors have got you going to 4,000 institutions, right? Every time you turn around, you're somewhere, man. You're back. You feel like you never got out, right? You know, oh, Jesus, here we are again. I hear bells and things like and locking and clanking, and, you know. And so you drive miles and miles and miles to institutions that you don't want to all over the goddamn state, you know, and you just go and go and go, and you're God, next thing you know, you got two years. Now you get three years, kind of, you start slowing down after about two, two and a half. You quit going to nine meetings a week. <clears throat> you take a night out and you go to a movie. You risk it all. <laughs> Nothing bad happens to you, so you go to another movie next week, you know. Now you're going to meetings and movies, man. You're beginning to become part of the world out there again, you know. Because going to work don't count. You never think of anything at work except the one you're going to get to the meeting that night or who you're going to kill on the job that you can't stand. <laughs> or you know they're firing you the next day, you know. So work is never really too much of an escape. <laughs> So now you start sliding into your third year of sobriety, and you've gone to institutions, and you've gone to meetings, and you've made coffee, and you've mopped floors, and you've folded chairs, and you've done all this, and you've been to a few movies, and if you're really brave, you may even have been to a dance, you may even eat eaten dinner where they serve alcohol, I don't know, you know, you may have, how far you have taken it, but now you're out there again, see, and so you slack off on a few more meetings, and now you're down to maybe three meetings a week, and you just say, eh, hey, it's okay, things are cool. And then suddenly, it's like, what happened for me, it was, I was putting every ounce of energy I had into not using and not drinking. I mean, every waking moment went into that. I mean, that's where my energy went. So I didn't have time for feelings either. I mean, you can't be having any feelings except anger and hostility, which you brought with you anyway. You know, immense rage from, from the streets. So that kind of goes with you the first couple of years if you have enough of it. So... <clears throat> It's almost like I did with the activity what I did when I drank and used. When I drank and used, I used the chemicals to hold the feelings down. Didn't want to feel anything, you use chemicals, you can control the feelings. I take this and I get that feeling. I take this and I get that. I shoot this and I get that. Now I got it wired, right? And so for years you go along until everything stops working and then you're come here. <laughs> <clears throat> no one drops an AA out of virtue. Nobody flies into their local AA meeting to shape up their life. God, you know, I sort of made a fool of myself last night at the cocktail party. I think I'll go to Alcoholics Anonymous. (laughs) 
it's when you're drug bleeding from the jail cell, man, to the bondsman, right? You know, with all your clothes half torn up. Say, God, you know what? My luck's getting really bad, man. <laughs> you know, I'll quit just yet, you know. One more chance. But anyhow, the chemicals help you control the feelings, and activity control helps you control the feelings, and then suddenly you're not putting in so much activity, you're not going to so many meetings, and that's why I think you find that a lot of people start getting a little crazy around three years. The insanity starts to rise. You can just feel it coming up. <clears throat> you know, it's like you can watch the people sitting around in meetings with their arms folded tightly across their chest trying to hold it down. <laughs> they know if they unfold their arms, they're going to go, ah, fuck it! So rather than release a real honest to God feeling, they just keep holding their chest. <laughs> and if you don't do anything about this state of affairs, I believe you'll get drunk. And the reason I believe that is I've been around here clean and sober for over 18 years now. And in that time, I've noticed one thing. There's a very large absence of birthdays for 6, 7, and 8. <laughs> Somebody identified. <laughs> and it's like, <clears throat> that, can't be, that can't be by mistake. That can't be an accident. I mean, there are always people coming in, so why the hell aren't they here, thank you, to take 6, 7, and 8? Why aren't they there to get those cakes? I believe they're not there because they're drunk. I know they ain't there because they're drunk. It's because the insanity has become too much. It's because the emotions have become too much. It's because ever since we were children, we've tried to hide these feelings. You know, you're little kids, you do it different ways. You doll, uh, stuffed animals, books, uh, sports. Uh, school. I mean, some people threw themselves totally into, into the educational process. Some people do themselves totally into the crime process. It doesn't matter what you did, but you did something to avoid these feelings until you discovered the world of chemicals and you could get some control, see? So ever since we were yay high, we've been running from these feelings, and then they blow up in sobriety and you're screwed. What are you going to do? Here you are, man, and A, B, and you're going totally stark raving bananas, and you know it. But you can't tell anybody, because nobody else is talking about it. Everybody else is smiling. <laughs> How are you, John? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's that's interesting. I heard that your wife divorced you, you lost your job, and your car was repoed this morning. <laughs> oh, yes, but it's nothing I can't handle. <clears throat> I'm going to deal with this one by not feeling it. <clears throat> So here we sit, a few years sober, banana cakes, nobody's talking about it, what the hell do you do? Those who are, those who are fortunate, surrender. Those who aren't, don't. Those who don't surrender, don't surrender for one reason and one reason only. Because you are afraid of what you think God has in store for you. And the only reason you are afraid of what you think God has in store for you is because you think of yourself as a piece of shit. May not be a pretty turn, but it's true. I'm absolutely, thoroughly, totally convinced beyond any doubt that there's a major basic problem in the alcoholic, it's absence of self-worth. We don't have any. None. Zip. I'm trying to get a little at 18 years. How come? What the hell happened to us? Why do we walk around this program with no self I mean, guys, do you realize that this program, if applied to your life, can create in your life the most incredible things you have ever known. I mean, I know people who apply this program to their lives and they're happy and prosperous and successful and their health is good and their outlook on life is good and their thinking is positive. They don't know about negative bullshit. They don't even want to hear negative. They don't want to know about hyper energy. They want to know about peace and quiet. <laughs> Go to an AA convention sometime. Look for a little peace and quiet. Walk through the lobby, registration time. You know. Take a guru through, man, he'd die halfway through the lobby. 
The energy, the energy would kill him. <laughs> he just wouldn't be able to take it. You're right. Because we're like this all the time, because we're holding all that crap back, and we won't let go of it. You can't let go. I can't surrender anything to God, because God don't care about me. He can't care about me. My mother and father didn't give a shit about me. How can God care about me? Sounds funny, man, but let me tell you how an angry young man is built. Okay? Because I went through a lot of years in this program, and it got me hot when I first realized what happened. I took a lot of inventories, okay, with five different sponsors. Now, my recollection of my life began at 15 years of age. I took five inventories. All began at 15 years of age. At no time did one of my sponsors say to me, what happened before then? And if they had, I would have just said, Jesus, I don't know, don't ask me. <laughs> I can't remember nothing. Zip. Blank. You know, no big deal. Who the hell needs that anyway, you know? Let's live today and get on with today's business here. Why do you react to women so strangely? I don't know. Don't bother me with that shit. It's got nothing to do with my childhood, for Christ's sake. <laughs> so uh, I just kept trucking right on through sobriety, and one thing finally got my attention. One day the ladies in my life now and I were having a rather loud discussion. And she pointed up to me that I had been married five times. <clears throat> and it's highly possible if you've been married five times, it's not them. <laughs> Never entered my mind. But when that was offered up to me, I thought about it for a minute, and an interesting thing. There is a number back there somewhere. I don't know if it's three, four. I don't know what one it is, but after you pass it, you just really can't say it's them. I went, Jesus, maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe I've got a problem. So I thought, well, who the hell am I going to talk to? So I thought, I think I'll get a therapist. So I went and got a woman therapist. <clears throat> I'd heard good things about her. I've been sober a long time. I've done the best job I knew how to do with this program. I've taken it as far as I could go based on the tools I had to work with. I couldn't do anything else. So I sat down with this lady therapist, and we had our initial meeting. I'm going to get to know her, and she's going to get to know me. So she said, well, tell me a little bit about your childhood. <clears throat> so I said, well, when I was 15 years old, I was sent to Manual Arts High School. Emmanuel Arts was a racially split school, and I was a hostile, angry young man, and I had a lot of trouble, and they threw me out in less than a year. That was the end of my formal education, and during that period of time, I also discovered the wonderful world of chemicals. And I talked on for a few more minutes, and finally she held her hand up. She said, no, wait. She said, I said, tell me a little bit about your childhood. And I said, I did. She said, your life did not begin at 15 years of age. That's a good point. <laughs> and I sat there and I looked at her for a minute and I said, I'd love to tell you about my childhood, but I can't remember anything about it. I said, I can recall maybe three incidents from the time I was born until now. And they are not, you know, really joyous incidents. Falling out of a second story window, you know, cute little things like that. On the back of my head, a lot of people said, oh, that's the problem. So she said, she laughed heartily, ha, 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 said that perhaps that we could, you know, find something to look at. Now, I spent a lot of time angry when I was young, okay? I had my first fist fight when I was four years old in a park. Now, you would think that if you got a four-year-old kid in a righteous fist fight in a park, somebody would say, how come he's so mad? standing there with his little blonde curly hair and his big blue eyes and his little sailor suit trying to punch some sucker twice his size. There must be something wrong, man. None of the other kids were out there in their little sailor suits, man, getting down, you know, in the park. Just me. See? But I didn't know why. Never did know why. You take when I was like eight years old, you know, it's kind of like... See, what's the first thing I can remember? Well, uh, the one of the first things I remember is I was, my people were poor, okay? 
<clears throat> now, nobody talked in our house ever. Like talking, nobody just talked. Screw talking or emotion. Nobody kissed, nobody hugged, nobody talked. It's like just be quiet. <clears throat> if you're quiet, you're good. Don't display any kind of emotion, happy or sad. He didn't want to be bothered, right? Okay, so it's like you learn very early on that silence is cool. I mean, I was able to sit through 72 hours of police interrogations and never even mention my name. You know, just sit. I wonder where I got the capacity for that because those can be fun. They get angry after about the first four. And it's like, I'll just be quiet because quiet was good. Quiet meant I was a good little boy. I didn't express any goddamn feelings or emotions, okay? But that leads to a small amount of anger. And other things lead to anger. Like Christmas time. You may say, what has this got to do with sobriety? For me, it's got a lot to do with sobriety. You may not be saying that. You may be listening, too. <laughs> Christmas time, I didn't have any money. I couldn't get any money. I couldn't go buy my mother a present, right? I mean, there was no money to buy her a present with. So I go out in the kitchen, all right? And I get, like, a cookie cutter and a spatula and a rolling pin, something. And I'd wrap them up in Christmas paper. And I'd put a little bow on it and scotch tape it, and I'd make out a little card for Mom, and I'd put it under the tree. Okay? That was my contribution to Christmas. So my mommy, man, I'm going to give her something wonderful. Wonderful to me, you know. Christmas morning, you come, she'd find that crap under the tree. She'd say, what is this? You know, I was looking for this for a week. You know. <laughs> Then she talk about the waste of paper, wrapping that stuff up. And a little tiny piece of me would die inside, die inside. Now, we lived in Los Angeles. We lived upstairs over a cosmetic factory. And and this was in the 40s, you know, and the cosmetics were simple then. Lipstick, powder, and that's it, you know, perfume. And it was, they made, I don't know, maybe six different things. And they threw out tons of stuff, right? Tons of cracked cosmetic cases or chipped mirrors or little pieces of the face powder was chipped out or the tube for the lipstick was dented or, you know, something was wrong and they couldn't sell it. They'd throw it out. Now, I was about eight years old, seven years old. I go downstairs, man, I go through these 50-gallon trash drums, right? I mean, I'd sort through hundreds of compacts and lipstick tubes and little makeup things, right? Looking for the one with the littlest dent. And the one with the littlest crack in the mirror. And the one with the littlest piece of face pancake makeup missing. And when I finally narrowed it down to the chosen few, I'd put them very carefully in a little box and I'd carry them upstairs. And I'd give them to my mother. I'm courting my mother. Hey, Mom, here. You know, look what your son has brought you. That neither one of you assholes wanted, right? <laughs> here it is. Cosmetics. She'd look through the box and say, oh, isn't that cute what little boys do and throw them away in the trash while I watched. Okay? A little piece inside of me would die, and I'd get angry. Then my mother would decide that my father should accept his fatherly responsibility, which he didn't want, <clears throat> and take me to a baseball game. Now, I never tell an alcoholic <laughs> kid to a baseball game, for Christ's sakes, man. I'm nine years old. I got this big old man on my hands. We go to the baseball game. He drinks beer, and I'm he's loaded now. He's drunk, can't remember how to get home, don't know where he is, and I'm standing there three feet high, man, saying, what the hell do I do now? I don't know how to get home. I don't know where to go. This guy is reeling around the parking lot, you know, like, I, I'll be okay, right, you know. <clears throat> and I got mad. A little bit of me died. A little bit of me got angry. It's like I would go when I'd reach out my arms to my father. I wanted to be held because I'd fallen off my bicycle. He didn't have time. Didn't want to touch. You know, not not affectionate. Uh, I got madder because if you won't hold me, if you won't take me to your breast, man, and you are my parent, then I feel like an asshole. Now, you want me to put some other label on it for the sake of the tape? Bullshit. That's what I feel like. And then I start to life feeling that way. So no wonder, man, I was punching people out in the hallway in high school for how they looked at me. Because I knew what they were thinking. I believed it. 
I told the board of criminal psychiatry, I don't read mine. <laughs> Poor choice of words. <laughs> Should have kept that a secret. <laughs> they call it paranoia. <laughs> Said I was a social psychopath. Ought to be put in a box. <laughs> If you feel unworthy, you won't do anything for yourself if you're like I am. If I am not worthwhile, then I will come to AA and I will sit down and I will work a holding action. I will do what is necessary for me to do in order to not drink and use today and I will not do one ounce more. Not one ounce more. I won't go get good spiritual books and read them and try and improve my spiritual outlook or my concept of God. I won't write affirmations. That's for other people who God is going to give good things to. I know what he's going to give me, and I'd like to put it off as long as I possibly can. <clears throat> it's like... In Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't know, you know, it seems that we have a lot of, maybe no more than society in which we live, but there are immense relationship problems. You know, terrible relationship problems. Of course, when people meet in the day room, <laughs> of your local nut factory, you're starting somewhat, you know, in a, in a minus position. <clears throat> But there are a lot of reasons for it, I think. You know, my opinion only. If you're new here tonight, everything I say is my own opinion. Buy the book, read it, you know, come back to another meeting tomorrow night, you'll hear somebody talk about drinking. <laughs> I think one of the reasons is we don't yet know who the hell we are. Because if you're not worthwhile, you're not going to take a lot of time to get to know yourself. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like if you ever walk by a guy sitting on a street corner or hanging on a lamppost, man, you know, he's got one sock on, one sock off, and half his clothes are one color, and half his clothes are the other color, and he's just basically drooling down the front of himself. He don't stop and chat. You know? I say, hey, I've been looking for somebody like you for a long time. Uh, <laughs> my name's Bob. I just want to find out what you're all about. You know, well, <clears throat> that's kind of, if you're like I am, that's the image you have of yourself. That's just about how you view yourself, some sort of freak. So you're not going to sit down and take any time to get intimate and get to know this person. Just like you're not going to take any time to get intimate and get to know this clowns laying on the corner. You're going to run from both of them. It's hard to do when you live with one of them. <laughs> that one goes everywhere you go. So you don't know what the hell you're looking for. You don't know what you want in life. You don't know what you want in employment. You don't know what you want in God. You don't know what you want in women. You don't know what you're nothing. If you're like, I am, you don't know nothing. You're just trying not to drink and use today. <laughs> so you're in your initial sobriety. It's like... <clears throat> it's like... Relationships, as I understand relationships, are... Give and take. Supposed to give love and tenderness and affection, respect to this other person. You're supposed to get it back in return. Now your question is an interesting one. Somebody posed posed to me. How do you expect to give to another human being love, affection, tenderness, intimacy, understanding until you've given these things to yourself? And isn't it interesting, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous has a heavy line, and I already thought it trans applied to sobriety. You cannot transmit something you haven't got. You cannot transmit something you haven't got. I mean, most of us meet in Alcoholics Anonymous, and we we're, looking for, <clears throat> we're looking for mates, but we don't know what we're looking for. It's like, you ladies, if you will pardon me for being so forward as to Assume what you might be looking for. <laughs> Wants us to ride in on our white charger dressed in armor. <laughs> <laughs> Shiny, non creaking, problem free armor.
or a housebroken horse. <laughs> to rescue you from the doldrums of life, to take you away from the pain and suffering of trying to cut it one day at a time on a daily basis. And maybe we'll give you the affection that your father has never given you, and we'll give you the approval that daddy never gave you. And if we don't, you're going to get us for him. <laughs> <clears throat> and we guys, of course, being cool, and together and suave and sophisticated and manly, our needs are much more simple. Simple. <clears throat> We're looking for mom. <laughs> but when we meet, we like there's a little person living inside of us that knows this fact, but to the big adult standing outside of our, our, our image or our idea of an adult, which is kind of humorous, <laughs> standing out here refuses to acknowledge that. So when we're at an AA meeting and we're alone and lonely and we're desperate and <clears throat> we go to one certain meeting because we know the good-looking girls go there and, and you have an instinct, you know, tonight is night. <clears throat> <clears throat> it's, like, it's like you dress. Knowing that tonight is the night, you go to the meeting, prepare your best slacks, man, you put on, you know, good-looking shirt, your one silk shirt, 100%. Sign your shoes, you get looking just as sharp as you can get, make sure the car goes to the car wash, you get a wax put on this time. Get everything ready, clean the pad, you know. And, of course, on the other side, she knows that Sir Lancelot is going to come through the doors tonight. Sir Lancelot does not attend AA, honey. <laughs> He never had to drink. <laughs> <clears throat> so you pay great attention to your makeup and your care, your sexiest little outfit, and zingo, you come to the meeting. And about the time the meeting is over and the Lord's Prayer is over, you turn around and he looks and she looks and God, there they are. You know, she looks over and she sees you standing there cool and suave. You're talking to a newcomer, you're listening to a goddamn thing he says, right? <laughs> You just make sure you're standing good. <laughs> so that when she sees you, you look interested. Guys, I got a gun in the car. I'm going to kill myself. Jeez, that's far out, right, you know. <laughs> Finally, you see that she's free from her conversation. And you look, and you get a good, hard look, and the little boy inside says, God, it's Mom! <laughs> and so you immediately truck across the knee, man, like an arrow. <laughs> Way you go. And you meet, and you chit-chat, and you say, how about a little coffee, and we can discuss the third step. <clears throat> <laughs> Try and keep this as spiritual as possible. <clears throat> And away you go, and it's got the third step. For the next 21 days, you're inseparable. <laughs> you do not see or talk to another human being. <laughs> and after 21 days, suddenly, the little boy has some needs inside for Mom. I need some love, Mom. <laughs> and it's darling damsel needs some protection and strength and care from this knight in shining armor. She turns to him and says, Take care of me. And the two of you look at each other and say, The fuck, you got problems? I don't want any problems. I have enough problems about your shit. Call your sponsor. treat each other like that because we don't treat ourselves any better. 
then all laughs to aside, the only reason I treat another human being that way is because I treat myself that way. I won't do the nice things for me. I won't take care of me. I won't look after me. Why well, work the steps? I am not close to one human being that I know of who has willingly, voluntarily gotten up in the morning and gotten the big book when they were in a really good place. So I'm going to work a step today. I think it'll make me feel better. The people I know, most of them, I can find dust on their books. <laughs> Always keep it dusted. There are sponsors who will come in your house and go... <laughs> <laughs> And if they find dust in 10 days, you're going to have a quiz. <laughs> and it won't be on Chapter 5. <laughs> the people I know, man, go to work a step when they're just about dead. When they have shot every angle, when you have shot every angle you can shoot. When you stayed awake all night thinking, figuring, scheming, maneuvering, manipulating, you've got headaches, acid indigestion, you're totally crazy, you can't talk to anybody. You can't come up with a goddamn solution. You talk to everybody you know 14 times, and they don't have the goddamn answer. You're taking it to the wall. You have no place to go. You're now down to three simple options. Drink, blow your brains out, or work the next step. <laughs> and at that point, you will work the next step. But in that, in that instance, you're working it in again with this holding off the addiction alcoholism attitude. It's... Oh, God, I'll use it for a life preserver. Hey, and they're wonderful life preservers. And every now and then you'll meet cool, hip, slick, strong people. Maybe some of the crime partners from the street, you'll run into them and they'll say, program is a crutch. Take a look at their life and look at yours, man, and then just, you know. <laughs> I always run into them and go back into penitentiary and talk, right? You run into old partners. You get all done, they'll come up to you afterwards and say, that program's for chicken tits, man. You know what I mean? I mean, it's a crutch. You're limping around on that crutch. I don't need that kind of crap. I'm strong. I'm running a whole goddamn tear. Nobody fucks with me. I always smile at him, laugh, say, yeah, sucker, well, I'm going to limp out here on my crutch, <laughs> and I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home in my white Seville. I'm going to go home to my good-looking old lady, and we're going to make love and maybe say the third step, and then we're going to go to bed and go to sleep. Well, you lay up here all night long, wide awake, praying some son of a bitch seven feet tall, 300 pounds, don't come through that door and fall in love with your ass. <laughs> so anytime anybody tells you this program is a crutch, just smile. Go on your way. Because it is a crutch. It's the best crutch in the world. It holds up a sick and broken person, me, until I can find out things like, God, I can't remember my childhood. I need help. Geez, I don't have any self-worth. I better do something about that. I mean, at first, when I started going through some of this stuff last year, I was embarrassed, right? I said, Jesus, 17 years sober, man, and you're just, you know, don't say anything to anybody, for Christ's sake. <laughs> I mean, after all, you know, there's got to be some people who have learned a lot of this stuff earlier, you know what I mean? <laughs> And I was talking to some of my friends about it, and they said, Bullshit, don't you dare not talk about it. It gives us hope to know that in 17 years, man, you can still be growing and learning and changing. That this program really does work. And it really does work. And change is the essence of it. And this is a year of change for me. It's a year of character building. I hate it. <laughs> what does a part of me like to just duck the whole thing? Say, oh, no. You know, the book says, well, you come to the fork in the road between character building and comfort. <laughs> Right? Comfort is lost in the dust of our rush. Our character building is lost in the dust of our rush for comfort. Why do anything to make me better? Somebody just, uh, Gloria, just give me a line out of a book about you got to go beyond your comfort zone to expect to grow. <whistles> go beyond my comfort zone? Don't you know, for Christ's sakes, I held up pharmaceutical warehouses? <laughs> 
to stay in my comfort zone? <laughs> hey, you want me to willingly <laughs> just sit around and go, no. Tell that to the sucker next door. I don't like him. Let the group across town go beyond their comfort zone. <laughs> we'll stay over here and be quiet. If somebody said, geez, what do you think is probably the most important aspect of sobriety other than not drinking, I'd have to say work on your self-worth. I honest to God mean that, man. It's we're really okay people, you know that? I mean, we are beautiful, goddamn people. You know, we're just kind of really gorgeous. There are little kids inside of every one of us. It's perfect. Perfect. Because the kid went into hiding when the shit started coming down from the parents. <laughs> he said, no, man, uh-oh. You know, catch me in 30 years. I ain't going for this one, you know. <laughs> I'll come back later. <laughs> you just get out here and handle this for a little while. So we did. We learned how to handle it. We put up one wall after another, after another, after another, after another to protect ourselves from the crap that was coming down. And the sad thing about it is those same walls that I put up between me and them and me and you were between me and me. I can't tear down the walls. I can't get to me until I tear down the walls that are between you and me. Because it's the same wall. It's the same armor. I got to get back to that little guy who's walking around with his curly blue hair, his curly curly hair. I dyed a green once. <laughs> who's walking around with his blonde curly hair, his little blue eyes, and his little sailor suit, man? Because he's yet yet had a chance. He has not yet lived any of this life. And you may say, well, has this got to do with sobriety? Maybe nothing. I don't know, but I'm having a lot of you know get a lot of good out of it today. <clears throat> And nobody asked me here to tell you what, you know, <laughs> you thought what sobriety was about. <clears throat> of course, they may be surprised, too, because this may not be the talk they thought I was bringing with me. <laughs> but God damn it, you know, I mean, have you, ever, have you ever listened to your own thinking? If any human being on the face of this earth said to you what you say to you, you would kill them. <laughs> You would have to kill them. The humiliation would be so immense, you would have to kill them. You know, I started a run recently, okay? And one more time, man, it put me in touch with my mind. Okay, about a month ago, I started a run. And after three or four days, I realized none of the other runners, when I run in the morning, are saying, hey, give it up, you can't make it. What are you doing out here, asshole? You're too old to be doing this. <clears throat> Your chest hurts, you got a pain in your side, you can't go another step, right? Ain't none of the other people out there saying all that to me. I'm the only one saying it to me. <laughs> they're all saying, hey, hi, how are you? Hey, thumbs up, keep going. You know, they're all on my side. I'm the only one not on my side. <laughs> second, just think of the things you tell yourself. Let somebody come to you with a positive opportunity. I know you've been out of work for a month, Bill. There's a job down the street over here. I know you can get it. It's paid three times the money you have ever made in your life anywhere. And they'll love you. Does your head say, hey, great. <laughs> God, I'll go right over. It'll be terrific. I'm ready. And then just say, don't bother, asshole, man. You're never going to be able to cut that job for Christ's sake, you know. You'll be there three days. They'll find you out, putz. You're finished. <laughs> don't humiliate yourself. Take a lousy job, something you can handle. <laughs> Wash cars. We sit here with a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous resting on our bookshelves at home, and these principles applied to your life, man, can set you on an adventure beyond anything you ever dreamed possible, and you won't work it. Why don't you work it? Because you're a bad person? No, you're a wonderful person. You're an absolutely wonderful person. You're just beset with his mind. It is his machinery. 
I'm learning an interesting thing about this machinery. It's not as powerful as it told me it was. <laughs> they said some, you know, 2,000 years ago, somebody was very smart. Said the mind is an excellent servant and a terrible master. Must mean that if you use it for adding 2 plus 2, it's okay, but when you start predicting tomorrow, you're in a lot of trouble. And yet it'll spend all its time on tomorrow. And the day after tomorrow, or next week, next month, or 12 years ago. Just start trying to feel good and watch it go back into your past, man, and find some grungy set of circumstances <clears throat> that you were involved in while you were drinking and using just to remind you that you're worthless. Don't be getting carried away with being a good guy or uh, remember this and that and this. Just be grateful you're not loaded today, sucker. Don't ask for nothing else. <laughs> we have to laugh at it, because if we didn't laugh at it, we'd have to blow our brains out. You ever notice? And it's true that I say it all the time, man, because there's a heavy point here. People who pick up guns to kill themselves do not shoot themselves in the foot. Oh. And I have some friends who have gone that way. And they went that way for one reason. They were trying to stop the goddamn voices. And not the ones drinking and using. The ones in sobriety. The voices nobody talks about in sobriety. Because we come here and we play some game. It's amazing. We sit down in an AA meeting. We come to our very first meeting. Our whole life is totally destroyed. Right? Looks like... San Francisco after the quake, for Christ's sakes. Now, I know somebody will go home, somebody's head said, oh, Jesus, I wonder what it will be tonight, right? <laughs> <laughs> they will never leave you alone. <laughs> and you sit down at an AA meeting, and this mind begins to go to work against you. Against you. It's like... It's sad, is what it is. It's really sad. But the one thing I've learned lately, which is really interesting to me, is I have no responsibility for the first thought that pops into my mind. Zip. Okay? Because I'm 18 years, man, and thoughts can roar into my head that are still as mad and as insane as what was going on when I was out there ripping and running in a world of weapons and dying. Same thought. But the one thing my mind never let me find out is that I do have responsibility for the entertaining of that thought. Now, you may not want to hear this, and your mind definitely will not want to hear this. <clears throat> so listen carefully, because it's going to resist. <clears throat> Every time your mind throws a negative thought at you about how rotten you are, how broke you are, how sick you are, how you're a failure, how you're going to be a failure, how you're going to be sick, how you're going to be broke. No matter what kind of negative bullshit it hurls at you, the next thought can be positive if you want it to be. All right? But then, why waste the effort? if you're not worth anything anyway. If you have no value, if your feelings have no value, if you are of no importance, if you are this terrible, sick, demented, bent, crippled up alcoholic man who's really a bad guy at heart, why think positively? Your life might get better. I've been watching some people, some friends of mine in Southern California who start a mad rash of writing affirmations and everybody's life is changing. And there are people standing around watching. They aren't watching, waiting for them to get more good in their life. They're watching, waiting for them to fall on their ass. So they say, I knew that crap wouldn't work. Somebody said something one time at the time. It was said because it came from a person who I knew loved me very much and knew loved this lady very much. I knew it was meant with all the warmth and sincerity in the world. But I was married at one time, and the lady I was married to, we found out a month after we were married that she was going to die from cancer. 
As he came home from the hospital that day, that we came home from the hospital, Arnold was the knowledge that she had very little time left. A mutual friend of ours came by the house, sat down, chit chat with us. And he looked at her and he said, Trust me. He said, Try having a positive attitude about this for three days. It can't hurt a thing. Can't hurt a thing. So if someone out of love can share that with someone who's been told they have a short time left, maybe you might think about sharing that with yourself the next time this brain is telling you that you're going broke or you're going to go hungry or you're going to die or your program sucks or your job sucks or you'll never get another one or you'll never have a decent relationship with all the positive information that it puts on you daily from the time you wake up. You might say to yourself, look, guys, because there's a lot of them up there, Why don't we try a positive attitude here for two or three days? It can't hurt a thing. See, there's no reason in the world that I can't have anything anybody else has got. None. No, I say, you know, it's like, see, the thing is, as long as I choose to believe that I am limited, I am limited. And I believe I'm limited because I don't have any self-worth. But I know that's a lie, because the job I have today, the work I do, the money I earn, the state of my life is totally, absolutely inconceivable. It's impossible to be where I am from where I came from. And you can't logically put me there because I'm lacking in education and skills to do the job I'm doing. <sighs> and yeah, I'm probably one of the ten highest paid at what I do. Bitch. <laughs> right? But I surrendered. It's the same kind of thing. It's like, it's like <clears throat> if you're job hunting, if your thing is employment right now, if you're out of work, and I know what the mind can do when you're out of work, right? I mean, it can just almost send you to the funny farm, you know? Right, yeah, God, you're never going to get another job. What are we going to do now? Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, I mean, it's on and on. It's never anything positive or constructive, you know. Well, let's lay a little plan for today. We'll go here, here, and here. And this looks excellent. We have a wonderful possibility. Yeah. I can pick up the Los Angeles Times on a Sunday and read it from beginning to end and find 30,000 ads that say, we don't want you. <laughs> Which takes care of the job, honey. I know people who have decided, see, as long as you believe, it's like, mm. they say, some of the masters, that there, you have a couple of levels of consciousness which you can choose to live at. One is this one, and one is one step beyond, or above. <laughs> <laughs> one step beyond was a little more when we're out there, I think. <laughs> Twilight Zone, I believe, was the show. <laughs> One step above. And if, if you're like, if, if it's like employment, if you're thinking about work, it very simply means this. It means that if you believe that the guy sitting across the other side of the desk has got the power to hire you or not to hire you, he does. If you believe that to be true, it's true. If you choose to believe that the guy sitting across the other side of the desk does not have the power to hire you or not to hire you, that God is the only person who has the power to put you in a job, and he will put you in exactly the right job at the right place at the right time with the right people, then this sucker ain't got no power. And if you believe that, you will find yourself having an experience that a lot of us have had. Some guy is going to be sitting on the other side of the desk looking at you saying, I don't know why the fuck I'm hiring you. <laughs> I mean, you're not qualified, you know what I mean? But what the hell I like is show up on Monday and we'll go to work. They say, some spiritual people somewhere, sometime, at some point, have made the statement that nothing in your life needs to be changed but your own consciousness. If you're sitting right now in a lot of misery and emotional pain and anguish and anxiety and just... Uh, and your mind is going crazy with what you should change, you shouldn't change. You should move, I can't move. You gotta move. Oh, you can't move, man. You don't have the money to move. You gotta leave him. No, I can't leave him. You gotta leave her, I can't go. Jesus will never be anybody else. You can't. You gotta stay here. No, I can't. I gotta, you know. It's just, it's just a quiet day sitting around the house having a little coffee. You know. 
you and all the friends who drop in in the morning. <laughs> When you're in that state, it's impossible to believe that the only thing you need to change is the consciousness. If you change your consciousness, what you believe to be true. If you change what you believe to be true, the bullshit out here will change as a result. Now, the other side of that coin, which is very unpleasant, means if your life is filled with shit, guess how it got there? <clears throat> I mean, if one side's true, the other side can't be false. You know what I mean? So if you're sitting in the middle of a pile of crap, guess who drew it in? And that's no fun to look at. Doing a goddamn job you hate and nobody likes you and you don't like anybody on it. Guess how you got there? Guess how you drew it into your own consciousness? Why it applies to relationship, it applies to where you live, it applies to everything in your life. If it's there, you wanted it. <laughs> I hope nobody's armed. <laughs> when I first heard that, boy, I got angry. But I got some of it to tell me that. I don't want this crap. If I could do anything, I'd get rid of it. You didn't get rid of it. <laughs> well... Couple of things that I'm attached to, you know what I mean? And, mm, not that bad yet. I'm not bleeding yet. <laughs> Just bruised. Boredom alcohol. Let's talk about boredom. Jesus, they say that we're so incurable, incurably neurotic in sobriety that if you show the alcoholic a lot, he will move in and furnish it. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> the mind will take you anywhere that it's comfortable it'll kill you. People say, how do you, just, how do you determine God's will? Simplest directions I've ever heard is go out the door and keep going until you run into a wall. When you hit a wall, turn left. <clears throat> That's how you'll find out. But the problem arises there. How can you just kind of drift out there into the world, into life itself, without a map? <laughs> the mind wants to know where the hell it's going. <clears throat> it can't stand surprises. <laughs> Catch it off guard that wants to go hide. Hates being embarrassed. We'll do anything to be cool. The mind is terminally cool, willing to die. <laughs> it wants to look good at all costs, meaning you. No one else pays for our need to appear terminally cool but us. You don't pay, I pay. I don't get to know you because I've got to be too cool to say hello. I don't get to have a good job because it's going to be too cool to risk rejection. Don't go where the waters aren't familiar. Watch neurotic people plan vacations. And you get a phone call at the last minute telling them the plane's delayed an hour. Oh, my God, what am I going to do when I get to Paris? Jesus, I'll be an hour late. Jesus, I'll the whole thing fucked up now. I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, all right, you know. Don't go with the flow, you know. I mean, Jesus, something good might happen to you. <clears throat> it's one of the reasons the, my, my mind avoids anything unknown. You know, it's like, because it, and if it can't, if I start getting that, that urge, man, if that inner thing of that light inside starts to get a little bright, that spiritual part of my being starts saying, hey, let's go live a little bit. My mind says, don't be ridiculous. What's around that corner for you is bad, not good, bad. God is waiting for you, sucker, and he's armed. <laughs> if I could sit quietly somewhere peacefully with myself and say to myself, Bobby, you're all right. 
You are a child of a loving Father who art in heaven. And he wants you to have everything in this world. And it is his pleasure to give you these things because you are his child. Let's remember whose child we really are and cut some unnecessary ties. If I could say that to myself, I wouldn't hesitate to kind of wander out in the morning and go about having a good day. If my father is this power that's so incredible that nothing can stand in its way but me, nothing but me, I am the only thing that can separate me from God. Nobody has that power. Not my boss, not the lady in my life, not my mother. Nobody has the power. No human power can separate me from God. Just me. My mind. Because it says I'm no good. I see, I, you know, it's like I feel like a broken record, man. I hate to keep harping on that, but it's like I'm just, you know, getting in touch with this crap, and I just want to, I have friends of mine, you should listen to around me, man. I've got babies I've grabbed by the throat and said, I got a new program for you, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of books to read from shit to write and get started now. I'm going to cut ten years of bullshit out of your sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, don't miss the fun, right? Somebody said, yeah, don't want to miss the fun. <laughs> Certainly, wonderful time. Bankruptcy, working in car washes, automobiles being repossessed, in divorce court, just generally having a good time sober, you know. <laughs> in total emotional pain most of the time, and your mind will always sabotage you. It will find the times that it knows that you will not call anyone, and that's the times it will attack you. If you have something against calling people at the dinner hour, it will always come get you at dinner time <laughs> and start telling you all these horrible things. If you were one of these people who won't call people in the middle of the night because you don't want to be embarrassed by being in pain at 3 a.m., it will always attack you at 3 a.m. It will keep you awake all night telling you nice things about how joyous life is and how wonderful and how filled with companionship and contentment and peace and prosperity and abundance it can be. <laughs> It'll make you believe you're, you're lucky if you live to see daylight. <laughs> you ever say you bump your arm, you get a bruise, you wake up the next morning, it's never a bruise, it's bone cancer. <laughs> but, oh, God, I knew it. My days are numbered now, Jesus. <laughs> you put anything in front of me and I will see the negative in it immediately. I don't care who it is you put in front of me. I don't care what it is you put in front of me. I will see the negative immediately. Not the positive. Never the positive. My head goes to the negative first like a computer. That quick. Offer me a million dollars, and the first thing my head is going to do is wonder about the taxes. <laughs> or, because I have fantasized that, you know, somebody walked up and handed me a million bucks once, and the first thing my mind said to me is, well, you could get a yacht, a neat car, and a house, but you'd have to go fast because you died before a year or so. <laughs> Always to the negative, okay? That comes back again, man, to the fact that I can't see me as a beautiful person. And you guys, the interesting thing is, you guys aren't stopping me. You aren't stopping me. I'm stopping me. You know, there's a few who are trying to hold you back or slow you down. <laughs> it is harder in some areas in Alcoholics Anonymous to share success than it is failure. I'm serious. And I'm not putting anybody down. I'm not making, you know... It's, a, it's just a fact, that, man, it's a fact that exists, and there's a good reason for that, you know? And the reason is, if I let you share your success with an attitude of happiness and joy and hey, hey, i got to say, wait a minute, where the hell is mine? How come this puppy's got a night on? I'm smarter than he is. I have got to look at my life if yours is good and mine isn't. See, and my mind doesn't want me to do that. 
Because under close scrutiny, I eventually, someday, have got to quit listening to my mind and start listening to my heart. Well, how the hell can you listen to your heart when you try listening to your heart when you were four and somebody shut a door in your head? You say, wait a minute, no more of that. You know, there's those of you who are parents, next time the kid brings you a little rock, you might polish it and tie a string around it hanging on your neck. See? Because that rock's very important to him. Really important to him. I've heard of some interesting meetings that are, or, or, that are for the children. A lot of us have alcoholic parents. I'm an alcoholic father. For the children of alcoholic parents, does have anything to do with whether or not you're an alcoholic. And that the meetings are just incredible. Because the identification of the pain is so strong that most people used to be winding up broken up throughout the meeting. And it's those little things. They sound dumb, but they aren't, man. They really aren't. It's the, the, the tie to rock on the goddamn string, and it's not dumb, do it. It's an act of love. It's an act of love. Because if you bring that little tiny rock to God, as which is you, and offer it to him, he'll hold it in the palm of his hand forever. Forever. So if you can set your mind aside in sobriety and offer this rock, this dirty, gringy, goddamn rock, to how you see yourself as this old stone, if you say, here, Father, I will give you this rock, this old stone, the next time you look, you'll see a small child carved in the palm of his hand, and it will be you. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.